That's my baby. Heartburn. The Hitcher. It's my fault. I got a shot lift at the Little Tyke section of Goodwill. Howard the Duck. What do these three films have in common? Apart, of course, from the fact that they all begin with the letter H. <laughs> They're three of the year's worst movies, and that's what we'll be looking at on this special edition called The Worst Movies of 1986. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Now, a few words of explanation first. As is our custom, we don't really pick the very worst films of the year. If we did that, We'd be selecting mostly sequels and dumb action pictures that no one wants to see in the first place. No, what we try to do with our Worst Ten show is skewer the ten biggest disappointments of the year. Films that pretended to be, or at least had the resources to be, something and were not. In alphabetical order, we're leading off with extremities, which means all the producers, Roger, if you think about it, is beginning with A, B, C, and D, and most of the E's, because extremities, the E-X, you know? And all those people, you can now relax, don't tune out. Don't you want to see the pain we're going to inflict on all these other films? We'll start now with Extremity, starring Farrah Fawcett. It pretended to be an anti-rape film, but it was nothing more than a slasher movie in fancy dress. As we watched Fawcett beaten and tortured and then turn around and subdue her attacker. But she never gets out of her negligee. No, that would hurt the box office. So she simply tortures the creep whom she has tied up. They lock me up. I get out. I get you. Now that's mildly rough, but the film doesn't continue with her getting really nasty because it doesn't have the guts to do that. Extremities is too timid to do that. Instead, it trots out, unbelievably, her two roommates who don't believe her story and instead sympathize with the guy. That's incredible, especially because they can see that she has been beaten and especially because she has been living in their same house for probably a couple of years and they've never met him. Sure, I'll believe a perfect stranger who's beaten up my roommate. That makes a lot of sense. Thus, Extremities is an illogical and also, I think, a very pretentious movie. You know, this whole idea of having an anti-rape film where the woman s sits around all the time in sexy negligee is kind of the 1986 version of the old Bible pictures. Remember the most, oh, uh, the favorite saying. character in all the Bible movies? Salome, yeah. right? And we're going to have a very religious picture in which Salome is going to get down to the, about the second veil, you know, before we cut away. Right. And it's the same thing. You take a sexy subject and you dress it up in a fashionable cause so it looks like you're being noble. And I don't want to pick on Farrah Fawcett, but I must say that the whole ad campaign and it was our publicity campaign that no. surrounded her performance as this great performance, just because she was on a TV show and she runs around and screams a lot doesn't make it great. There are, and I say this without disrespect to her, there are a hundred actresses who could have pulled off that role. It was nothing special. Okay, next movie. Our next movie is named Heartburn, and this is one of the major disappointments of the year because everyone involved in it had given us so many good movies in the past. Who would have guessed that a movie inspired by a famous celebrity marriage, a tempestuous marriage that inspired a best-selling novel, a movie starring Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep as the unhappily married couple, a movie directed by Mike Nichols who made The Graduate in Catch-22, that this movie would turn out to be a bore, and yet that's what happened. Mm -hmm. There was little joy and little passion and heartburn, but there sure was a lot of gossip and a lot of backbiting, as, for example, in this scene. Thelma Rice is having an affair. Yeah. With whom? No. I don't know. Oh, come oh, on. Oh, no. With you someone. Don't know. This is what I know. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be that difficult to figure out who. It has to be someone taller than she is, <laughs> which rules out practically everybody. <laughs> And, of course, Nicholson is having an affair right while he's sitting there having that conversation. Nicholson and Streep are capable of great electricity in their performances, but you don't see it in this movie. They both seem sort of dispirited, going through the motions. Maybe the project itself never really took off and excited them. Maybe the problem was that the screenplay was by Nora Ephron, who based it on her own novel and based the novel on her own marriage, and she just wasn't able to stand back far enough to see the humor, and boy, I couldn't see the humor either. Or the pain, actually. Uh, the, uh, the humor that they threw in the film seemed to me totally illogical. Mm -hmm. Here I'm going to see, with two of our greatest stars, a movie about the dis dissolution of a marriage. Mm -hmm. No more important subject, probably, at least in, in domestic life. And what do we get? Whole passages about how difficult it is for them to build their house. Remember the running around with mm -hmm. the contractors mm -hmm. and all? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, where's the pain? 
Where's either the joy of the relationship, which isn't shown, mm -hmm. or where is the pain? It's almost as if they left out all the important scenes and put in all the stuff in between. You know that that marriage didn't break up because of problems with contractors. It broke up because of problems in here, and the stuff in here is not on the screen. That's right. It's absolutely missing. Our next film is the disgusting, meaningless shocker called The Hitcher. We're continuing to do this in alphabetical order, and it's a bad year for H's. <laughs> This was another variation on the indestructible killer movie, sort of a son of Friday the 13th. It starred Rutger Hauer as a psychopath who hitched a ride with a young man and chased him and a girl he met all over the western countryside, piling brutality upon brutality, almost in slow motion. That's right, take your time, shoot every part of the car, wait for the kid. At this point, we really like to have him almost blow the kid away so the movie will be over and we can go home because we've had a horrible time in this picture. The film, though, outdid itself with an incredible scene where the girl that this guy is traveling with is tied between two trucks. And then, yes, the trucks go this way and her body goes that way in two parts. And I saw that scene developing, and I said to myself, no, they're not going to really do that. Someone's going to stop in and save her, and no, no one did. Now, I have nothing against violent films as long as they try to make some sense or put some kind of spin on their violence. Violent films have made my best ten list, but The Hitcher was simply nonstop mayhem. Well, you know right away uh, when they abandon reality, in other words, this movie... Uh, moves within the first 10 minutes to a point where it's metaphor. It's not supposed to be taken seriously. But they're trying to make some kind of a statement. And the statement they're trying to make turns out to be a very sick one because, yeah. of course, the symbolism at the end of the movie indicates that this young man, having now killed the Hitcher, right. has become the Hitcher. That's in other right. words, this will become his mission to go and find another young victim and torture him. So that the movie is extremely sick uh, in its underlying uh, orientation. That's the same premise of the Friday the 13th movies. Mm -hmm. And Roger, what it is really based on is sequelitis. Because the, the killer is reincarnated in the Friday the 13th movies so that they continue and make another one. Uh -huh. Only I don't think we're going to see Hitcher 2. You never or at know. least I'm not. Okay. Well, I think you will, though, because that's what you get paid for. Not and, enough. Okay, fine. When we come back, we'll look at a movie that literally grossed pennies for every dollar it costs to make. It's called Howard the Duck, and it qualifies not just for this year, but as an all-time legendary bomb. Death from the skies to all duck hunters! The cleanser Dave uses to clean his groin. About two animals that were in the year's worst movies. One of them was a giant gorilla who finally got married, and Gene will get to him in a moment. And the other one was a duck named Howard. Yes, Howard the Duck came from outer space on a laser beam and landed in our society with a cigar in his mouth and a scowl on his face. And before long, the studio chiefs in Hollywood were scowling too because Howard laid a real big egg. The movie cost a reported more than $40 million to make, and it grossed just about $10,000 on a million. I don't know if you've ever got that math, but it's not real good. Here's Howard, a little man in a duck suit, visiting the Natural History Museum with his friend, played by Leah Thompson. I just want to know, A, what I'm doing here, and B, how I'm going to get back. Piece of cake. A, I'm just the guy to help, and that's because, B, I've already got a theory. What theory? Well... This is, of course, the evolutionary ladder showing how man progressed from monkey to me, for instance. You consider that progress? After the movie was released, everybody said with the benefit of hindsight that it was insane to make a movie about a duck from outer space. But I don't know. I think it would have been possible for Howard to maybe have worked if only they'd started with a funny, likable duck in a comedy. Instead, they made a grim, worried duck in a special effects adventure and then they filled the soundtrack with bittersweet and even downbeat music to be sure that we didn't get the feeling too good. What a miscalculation. Well, uh, the film is based on a comic book where he's sort of a wisecracking, uh -huh. like, you know, cynical Groucho Marx type duck. Uh -huh. If they had done that, that would have worked. Or make it warm a Donald kind of thing, kind of fun. But instead, there is this wandering all over the case where the central character, the duck, the one that we're going to be rooting for, uh -huh. have a rooting interest in, is neither funny nor 
uh, or bitter funny, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work at all. And as for the special effects, I think that comes out of the success of Ghostbusters, and it is just like thrown on at the end of the picture, at which point they've lost us completely. Right, well, the producer of the picture was George Lucas, and he has a company that does special effects. And, and they, they did, did all these special effects. So maybe they did a little more special effects than whether they wanted to make a movie about a duck. Maybe that would have been a good special effect. Just all done right up here. Our next movie of 1986 is King Kong Lives. And this movie was so bad, and the studio knew it, that they did something unprecedented with Roger and me. Now, occasionally, a film company won't give us a clip to review. But usually, it's a low-budget schlock film or a sleazy company. But the sequel to the entertaining 1976 King Kong should have been a classy production. That earlier film was a lot of fun, remember? Starring Jeff Bridges and Jessica Lange and the Big Ape. But this new one is so bad that the film company actually sent Roger and me letters saying they would let us show snippets of the film on our local TV shows in Chicago only if we promised in writing not to show you the same clips on this, our national show. Obviously, they were scared, and obviously, neither one of us would sign such a letter. So, no scenes from King Kong Lives. That's almost a public service. Instead, <laughs> just this warning. If you don't believe me or Roger, believe the film company that, think about it, couldn't find a single scene that it wanted you to see. This is really great. Loyalios, right? We have to sign a... No, I, I'm going to sign a piece of paper saying, no, I won't be a critic and I won't tell the truth about this film because I'm so eager to show this ape on television. Well, uh, they won't the movie get it from was me. a real bomb. And I, I have an experience I want to tell you. I saw this movie in a movie theater. Me too. And huh. I sat in the back row. Yep. And behind the back row was a door that swung like this. <laughs> and it became the plaything for all the children in the theater. The little kids that never met each other before all became friends and had fun swinging back and forth on the door because there was nothing on the screen that was even slightly entertaining to them. And so if they could have sold tickets to the door, they could have saved all the expense of shipping that print to Chicago. Inside, a swinging door. Come visit. Just like cool inside. Refrigeration in the old days. I'm sure the candy counter did a big business. Yeah, maybe it's going to be picked as the best film of the year by the popcorn <laughs> growers of America. Our next uh, movie on the list of the year's worst films, moving along here alphabetically, was called Pirates. And it was directed by Roman Polanski and starred Walter Matthau as one of the most unlikely movie pirates of all time. Here he is as Captain Red addressing the crew of the pirate ship that he has just commandeered. Divine Providence has seen fit to deliver this here vessel from the tyranny of your degenerated doggo masters. I do hereby take possession of her in the name of the brethren of the coast and shall henceforth command her. Sounds like that pirate was born in Brooklyn. Yep. Matthau is one of the funniest actors alive, but only when he can play a fairly halfway realistic character. In a movie like this, he simply looks ridiculous, and maybe it's not entirely his fault. Maybe nobody could have been funny or convincing in this project, which was basically more of a film to deal than it was a movie that anybody really believed in. My suggestion for how Polanski could have made his money back on this movie is kind of simple. He built that wonderful pirate ship from scratch. It really sails. He ought to sell it to an amusement park. With a swinging door on it. Yeah, so, that'd be terrific. Uh, double yeah. feature, King Kong yeah. and Pirates. <laughs> uh, this was stunning. I mean, Polanski is a great director, has been a great director. Mm -hmm. Matthau, a marvelously entertaining actor. Uh, they just made a bad pirate movie yeah. and stuck Matthau in it, who seems totally inappropriate. Uh, there's nothing more to add. Nothing works in the film. There's no humor. Polanski has been funny. Matthau's been funny. No humor. When we come back, a multi-million dollar bomb about the founding in one of the most exciting cities in the world. The list of 86 was so bad that the film company delayed showing it in New York City, the movie-going capital of America. And that was true even though it starred one of New York's most popular actors, Al Pacino. The film, Revolution. The subject, the Revolutionary War. Our Revolutionary War. A war that couldn't have been as boring as it is in this film. Even my grammar school film strips about the war. <laughs> I'm not talking about the movies. I'm talking about the click, oh, I remember the film that. strip. Yeah, you know right, those ones, yeah, you know? Yeah. With a little, maybe, grasshopper. Washington and the boat, right? Crossing the Delaware. You got it. Yeah. Even those little films made the war seem more exciting than this picture. Pacino played an 18th century fur trader with a 20th century Brooklyn accent, just like Walter Matthau, <laughs> who falls in love with a society girl played by Nastasia Kinski. After the war is over, Pacino hopes to resume a normal life, but in this scene, he finds out that his wartime pay has been devalued. 
All these men here, we all fought for something, and we got it. Yeah. Well, you think I didn't fight? You take it from us, and we're going to fight again. I'm taking nothing from you. You open your mouth to Congress. That's where your mouth belongs, not to me. My mouth belongs anywhere I put it. I guess that's supposed to be an 18th century Brooklyn accent. I don't, that's really what it sounds like. I don't know what's happened to Al Pacino. He's made a lot of good films early in his career. Not that many good ones lately. Hugh Hudson directed this film and did Chariots of Fire. The Revolutionary War has probably never looked so dull on film. No energy. They didn't have a story that they wanted to tell. And Pacino has made good recent movies like Scarface. And you mentioned that Hudson is a good director. But the story is the entire war told with a love story in the foreground and the war in the background. Mm -hmm. It's the same approach they would have taken 40 years ago. And Pacino and Kinski meet each other on this battleground over a period of six years about seven oh, times. coincidence. Each time by coincidence I know. to the point where it's when he's all alone on the screen, you say, well, he'll probably take a step <laughs> and fall over Kinski. Exactly. You can't, you have to just stop believing in it. Our next movie is named Tai Pan. Here's another great historical drama with heaving bosoms in the foreground. A movie <laughs> that tells the story of the founding of modern Hong Kong as if all the founding fathers have spent most of their time with their pants down. To give you an idea of how ridiculous this movie is, imagine that last movie, Revolution, with some extra scenes in which George Washington is also in bed with Natasha Kinski. Here's a typical scene from Taipan. Brian Brown plays the Taipan, the British ruler of Hong Kong, and Joan Chen plays his jealous Chinese mistress. Men. Men, not men. Men! I am told men surprise in that song that renews your prize. <laughs> You stand there and eat up her bosoms. I guess I didn't really expect a serious historical masterpiece when I went to see Taipan, but this movie wasn't even good trash. It's pretty obvious what they were trying to do, maybe sort of an Asian version of the TV show Dynasty in which everybody joins in a merry-go-round of sex and bloodshed. But the story is so disorganized, the characters are so badly written, that not only didn't I care what happened to them, they didn't even seem to care what happened to themselves. Yep. And then, of course, the great contradiction, nobody ages in 40 years. They're all the same age for the whole movie. Why take a best-selling novel, uh, you know, the, uh, James Cavell's novel, and finally, after a long time, make it into a movie and then strip it out of its historical importance or resonance, uh, thrilling? I mean, why not make us want to go visit Hong Kong today? Mm -hmm. This movie makes us want to not go anywhere near Hong Kong because it, it's, it's, it's built on stupidity. Well, you're right. Coming up next, the rock star prince goes from hero to goat in just one movie. Our next selection of one of the year's worst movies, Three Amigos. Now, to be fair, it did have some laughs. Three big ones for me, all involving Randy Newman's very clever songs. But I expect a whole lot more than that when I go to see a movie starring the considerable comic talents of Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short from SCTV. Instead of wit, we get too many action scenes with director John Landis, known for his action scenes, running three Western comedy actors in circles, creating a cloud of dust and no laughs. Fakey stuff. Dumb stuff. Not funny. Should have been more jokes and less action throughout the whole picture. A big disappointment. I thought it was going to be one of the funniest films of the year when I went walking in. Well, it uh, obviously is in the tradition of Blazing Saddles, and if it had been more in the tradition of Blazing Saddles, it would have been funnier. But they're satirizing here a kind of movie that most people under the age of 25 have never seen in the first place, so how do they know what they're making fun of? That's my question. Just not enough jokes. That's the other point. The tenth and final movie on our list of the year's ten worst films is a real disappointment from Prince, whose Purple Rain is one of the best films of two years mm -hmm. ago. His bad movie this year was named Under the Cherry Moon, and I was never able to figure out what he was trying to do in this movie, but maybe he was trying to combine an old Fred Astaire film with a perfume commercial. Here he is on the French Riviera, where he and his buddy are gigolos begging for an extension on their rent. Okay, you two. Don't try anything funny. Not this time, Christopher. I want the money, or I'll throw you both out onto the street. Please, madam, look at these poor, innocent faces. These mean streets are no place for a couple of fine, decent hoodlums like us. Please, Katie, search in your heart for some kindness. Why don't you try searching in your wallet for some money? <gasps> yes, 
That's right, Cotton. Look at that bellow the ghost he looks. I guess it takes a certain amount of courage for anyone to allow himself to be photographed that way, but my advice to Prince is be a coward the next time. <laughs> That's typical of the whole movie, which achieves a nice, glossy, black and white look and it never figures out anything entertaining to do with it. Prince is an entertainer who can shock with the power of his music, but as a recycled Fred Astaire, he seems a little bit lost. And the movie's plot is so thin and so silly that even Prince's fans laughed at it instead of laughing with it. Yeah. And that's a bad sign. Yeah. The movie didn't really last more than two weeks. No, I saw I saw in a theater with people and they were laughing at the picture. And uh, I think that it stopped almost with the art direction. I think you're quite right. I think that they wanted to do the stylized kind of old-fashioned 30s black and white picture and that was where the creativity stopped because mm -hmm. it's a stupid story we get this is the common theme in all of these most of these pictures script failure script failure script failure and that's it for this week next week we'll be back with reviews of new movies including duet for one starring julie andrews as a world famous violinist facing a crippling disease and wanted dead or alive an action thriller starring rutger hauer as a former cia agent turned bounty hunter that's next week until then the balcony is closed The Tap and Space Saver Microwave fits any lifestyle, any room, any space, any place. It's big on good cooking from Tap and makers of fine appliances. Raisinets and goobers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Pledge is self-cleaning, so it cleans away old polish for a fresh shine every time you dust. The 1987 edition of Roger Ebert's movie Home Companion, with more than 600 full-length reviews of movies on cassette, is available at bookstores.